Hello, I'm James Wahlberg, and I'm going to show you how to determine whether an electrochemical cell is an electrolytic cell or a galvanic cell. Let's get started. The first thing that we can do is to look at the cell potential. You'll recall that galvanic cells have a positive cell potential, and that's because these are spontaneous reactions. In contrast, electrolytic cells have negative cell potentials, and that's because these are non-spontaneous reactions. So we can simply do the math and determine whether we have a positive cell potential, therefore galvanic, or a negative cell potential, and therefore electrolytic. The other approach we can take is to examine all the information that we have in the cell diagram. For example, galvanic cells often have a voltmeter. They don't have to, but because they produce voltage, there's often a voltmeter to indicate just how much they're producing. They certainly must, however, have two separate half cells. And the very key diagnostic piece of information for a galvanic cell is that the anode is negatively charged and the cathode is positively charged. Contrast all of that with an electrolytic cell, which must have a power supply. Remember, these are non-spontaneous reactions, therefore we need an external power supply to power the reaction. Most often that's a battery, but it could be something else. So you look for that power supply and think electrolytic. The configuration of electrolytic cells also could be more complex than a galvanic cell. They could be two individual half cells, or the entire reaction could be contained within one cell. In any case, an electrolytic cell always has a positively charged anode, and a negatively charged cathode. So either the calculation approach where we look at the cell potential or by examining all the information from a cell diagram, we can determine what kind of a cell an electrochemical system is. Let's apply these ideas to a few examples. In this first example, we have an electrochemical reaction. And if you notice, iron starts as Fe3 plus and goes to Fe2 plus. Well, of course, its oxidation number is going from 3 plus down to 2 plus. And how could a number become less positive? Well, by gaining something negative. So it's gaining an electron. Remember, gaining electrons is reduction. And here's the red cat to remind you that reduction always happens at the cathode. This is true for electrolytic cells and for galvanic cells. So therefore, we know that iron is acting as the cathode. Let's look at the cell potentials here for these half reactions. And we see that for the iron reaction, the reduction potential is positive 0.771. And for the magnesium half reaction, the reduction potential is negative 2.37. So we put those into our equation that the overall potential is the cathode minus the anode. There's the calculation and you do the arithmetic and we see that the overall cell has a potential of positive 3.14 volts. Therefore, this is a galvanic cell. Not too bad, right? Let's look at another. Here, we have a cell diagram, and immediately we can see that there is no power supply. So we're automatically suspecting that this is not electrolytic, that this is galvanic. But let's look at the reduction potentials just to make sure. So let's find for each half reaction, the reduction potential, there's the chlorine, reduction potential positive 1.36. For the copper, positive 0.337. Therefore, we see that chlorine has the higher reduction potential. And remember what that phrase means, it is more likely to be reduced. So since reduction always happens at the cathode, if this is a galvanic system, we would expect that chlorine is going to be at the cathode. So let's look at what we know about the diagram. We see that the electrode where the chlorine reaction is, is positive, And the reaction where the copper is participating is negative. So since we know that for a galvanic system, the cathode is positive and the anode is negative, that yes, indeed, this is a galvanic system. All right, in our next example, we have neither a reaction nor a cell diagram to examine. We just have a little bit of information. We have a student making a keen observation that electrochemical cell has a salt bridge and that salt is 
potassium chloride. So that could be galvanic or electrolytic. But what the student notices is that the chloride ions are migrating toward the cathode. Well, considering that chloride ions are negatively charged, why would they migrate towards the cathode other than the cathode must be positively charged? So therefore, if we have a positively charged cathode, we know that here again, we have a galvanic reaction. Let's look at one last example. Here we have an electrochemical cell notation, and let's take advantage of all the information given in this notation. And the first thing to remember is that everything on the left side of the cell notation, everything to the left of that double vertical line, is the anode. These cells are always written anode on the left and cathode on the right. So if that is the anode, Let's look at the reduction potential for both of these half reactions. And we see that the nickel half reaction has a reduction potential of minus 0.25, while the strontium half reaction has a reduction potential of minus 2.89 volts. So putting that into our E cell calculation, we find that the overall cell potential is negative 2.64 volts and of course, the kind of cell that has a negative cell potential is an electrolytic cell. So I hope you see that there are several ways to determine exactly what type of electrochemical cell you're looking at, either from the actual reduction potentials or from information in the cell diagram or from cell notation. There's a lot of information there. If you think carefully about the properties of each kind of cell, you'll be able to spot no problem whether you have a galvanic or an electrolytic system. Thanks very much and good luck with your study of chemistry.